Okay, gentlemen, I have muted all of you. Um, Congressman Sawazi isn't in quite yet, but we are going to go ahead and open the room. So you'll be live. Uh, we will start in three minutes and I'll be doing an introduction that will take approximately two and a half minutes. So um, uh, Congressman Wolf, you're still on mute. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. So we are going live. Good morning and welcome to this discussion of human rights in Nigeria and the United States Congress. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be starting in one minute. Congressman Swazi, thanks for joining us today. How are you today? Well, thank you, Paul. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to get started in just a second, and um, we'll be I'll be doing an intro real quick. Hey, doing, Frank. Hi, Tom. How are Great. you? Thanks for doing this. I'm happy to try and help. I'm not. Don't know how much I can add, but you got a good heart for it, though. It's. I remember the prayer breakfast. You'll do well. Try my best. Thank you for joining us this morning, gentlemen. Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Paul Kincaid. I'm Outreach Director for FMC, the Association of Former Members of Congress. I'd like to welcome all of you to this, to this discussion today of Congress and human rights in Nigeria. This is an interactive discussion today, so if you have a question at any time, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, fill out your name and your question, and if we choose you, our moderator will call on you to ask your question over audio only to our panel. Again, anytime during the call, just click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The country of Nigeria sits on the United States, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and while changes have been made in the coastal African nation since adopting its constitution in 2012, the US State Department still recognizes many important human rights issues in the nation. At the top of the list is a still strong Boko Haram terrorist group that has attacked government and civilian targets, resulting in thousands of deaths, the internal displacement of millions, and the creation of more than 300,000 external refugees. Meanwhile, both state and non-state actors commit extrajudicial killings, torture, and kidnapping. Freedom of expression, religion, and LGBT rights are heavily curtailed, and protests of these abuses are met with violent reprisals from government agencies. Today, we'll discuss what Congress and the United States can do about these abuses. We're joined by two experts on the subject from the U.S. House. Congressman Tom Suwazi of New York is a Democratic member of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey is the co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. They're joined today by Dr. Richard Ikiebi, the director of the Center for Leadership and Journalism in Lagos. We hope to have a great discussion and moderating it today will be former Congressman Frank Wolf, a Republican from Virginia who served with Congressman Smith in the House. 
Congressman Wolf, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank FMC and Pete Wideland and the entire staff for doing this. I also want to thank Congressman Smith and Congressman Swazi for, for doing this. I am very grateful. Also, uh, Dr. Ikebi for joining us from Nigeria. The recent April 2021 report by the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom cites the difficulties faced by people of faith in Nigeria and lists Nigeria as one of 14 countries of particular concern. It's what they call a country of particular concern designation. The report begins, quote, in 2020, religious freedom conditions in Nigeria deteriorated with both state and non-state actors committing egregious violations of the right to freedom of religion or belief. Nigerian citizens face violence by militant Islamists and other non-state armed actors, as well as discrimination and arbitrary detentions and capital blasphemy sentences by state authorities. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa with about 219 million people. And by 2050, Nigeria will have a larger population than the United States. Genocide Watch has said that Boko Haram is committing genocide against children, especially girls that kidnaps to become sex slaves and it forces boys to become child soldiers. It massacres police and others associated with the Nigerian government and commits war crimes against ordinary citizens. Genocide Watch also said that the Fulani militants in central Nigeria are committing crimes against humanity and genocidal massacres against Christians. The Islamic State of West Africa is also operating in Nigeria in the Lake Chad region. In April of 2014, Boko Haram garnered worldwide attention for kidnapping 276 Christian schoolgirls the world responded with a hashtag bring back our girls Twitter campaign. But seven years later, more than 100 of the girls are still missing. Since then, there have been numerous, numerous attacks against schools with kidnapping of many children. Four American soldiers were killed in Niger and the Nigeria Lake Chad region could become a breeding ground and staging area for attacks against the West for terrorism and the reinsurgence of ISIS into Iraq. In addition, we see hunger, millions of displaced persons living in squalid conditions, kidnapping for ransom, little or no education in some areas, government corruption and human rights abuses by the military. Yet, we see very little reaction by governments in the West. In December of 2019, the Wall Street Journal carried a large article by Bernard Henry Levy, who said that what's happening in Nigeria could lead to a Darfur or a Rwanda. We know there was genocide in both Darfur and in Rwanda. He said when the world and the US ignored genocide in Rwanda, hundreds of thousands of people died and could history be repeating itself? Many experts believe that Nigeria could implode. This would destabilize the surrounding countries and send millions of refugees into Europe and beyond. The Ari Singer Bono actually said, if it unravels in Nigeria, it will be an existential threat to Europe and the world beyond. There are 350,000 to 400,000 Nigerian Americans were concerned over the fate of their relatives back in Nigeria. The challenges faced in Nigeria are great. However, it is my firm belief that the United States and other Western nations have a vested interest in confronting one of the worst crises of our times. And keep in mind, we have sent millions and millions of dollars to Nigeria. Nigeria has been fractured and many people think it has been forgotten. So we have genocide by Boko Haram, genocidal activity by the Fulani militants, rampant hunger, a look at the World Food Program statistics with regard to the country, little or no education in, in parts of the country where young kids are getting no education, sexual trafficking, there was a report of 15,000 women and girls being sexually trafficked alone in Southern Italy, 
massive government corruption, human rights abuses by the military, mass migration out of Nigeria, and we see really very little action taken by the West. And we see very little coverage by the Western media, except for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Just this morning, I read a report from World Magazine that says the following. It said, Nigerians have left their country for the United States and Europe for decades. But in 2018, Pew Research Center took a poll in Nigeria to find out how many others might leave. 45% of the Nigerian population said they expected to, within the next five years, leave. They then interviewed a young woman named Emmanuel, and I'll just read briefly what she said. In 2019, nearly 13,000 Nigerians emigrated to Canada alone. And then she goes on to say the following. On top of the economic insecurity in Nigeria, she says she faced daily fears for her safety. She says Nigeria is really unsafe right now on several levels, especially in several communities where just your religion makes you a target. Here, it's not the first thing you think about when you meet someone. Nigeria is very, very unsafe. I know many times I used to be scared getting home after work. And every day it was just pray, I get home safe. And I mean that in the most sincere way. And then it ends by saying the report that many of these same issues are pushing Nigeria's medical professionals to leave as well. The country only has 74,000 registered doctors for its 219,000 million people and doctors and nurses are leaving. It's very serious. Who's next, Frank? Well, I'm gonna ask a series of questions. First, I'll ask Dr. Ibeki, because he lives in Nigeria, from, from his perspective, what factors have gotten us to the crisis in Nigeria that we face today? Uh, thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, event, uh, I think it has come at a very uh, important time. I, I, hope, I hope it will make some difference and I hope it is not too late. What got us here uh, is arrogance, arrogance of the elite uh, rulers and, and those who run, run the, the nation here in Nigeria. Arrogance that the problems that were so obvious 10, 15 years ago will just suddenly go away and nobody took proactive action. Uh, what got us here is inability to see from a national perspective that we were faced with a problem that was so deep, so, so obvious for those who cared to see uh, what got us here is the, uh, as Congressman Wolf said a moment ago, is the, um, the Western press refusing to acknowledge that there are genocidal activities in Nigeria. The Western press refusing to acknowledge that there are even problems in Nigeria. Uh, what got us here is confused narrative. Uh, people saying everything else except addressing the real problem of how we got to where we are. Uh, what got us here is the opening up of Libya that, and the chasing away of ISIS from, from Europe and, and, uh, and, and allowing them in to come into Libya and down uh, into Niger, down into Mali. Uh, what got us here is the refusal to acknowledge that spiritual issues, that there are religious roots 
uh, for the problems that we have in Nigeria, that indeed Christians are being persecuted. Of course, Muslims are being killed as well. Uh, Muslims, uh, moderate Muslims are being killed. Christians are being killed. We have failed to acknowledge that there is a religious uh, issue uh, that is involved in what is happening. So if we want to go to the bottom of why and how we got here, we must ask the, the, the leaders, the, the political leaders who have buried their heads in the sand and have refused to acknowledge for 10 years, for, and particularly in the last five, six years, that Nigeria is faced with an existential problem. We are faced with an existential problem. The only yesterday, the governor of uh, Niger State, Niger State, not Niger, the country, came out and said that Boko Haram have pitched a flag next door, two hours away from the Nigerian federal capital. The same yesterday, the Benue State governor buried 70 people that were killed by the Fulani headsmen. He said it was the Fulani headsmen. Two days ago, the governor of, uh, I think, Abia or Imo, uh, no, no, Anambra, Enugu, had the same problem, burying uh, people that had been killed by, by these uh, hoodlums uh, ravaging the, uh, every, in every part of the country. Whether you go to the east, you go to the west, you go to the north, you are, there are killings on a daily basis. Just before I came on air on this program, somebody sent me a note from Kaduna and said that what is going on is like something that was taken out of the movie. So we have a nation that is just setting its, its, itself up for an implosion. I hope we are not too late. We were told yesterday that uh, the, the, the Secretary of State of the United States had a, a virtual meeting with the, with the President of Nigeria. I hope I hope he listened. I hope there were concrete issues discussed because where we are now, a senator was weeping in the, in the, in the federal house of a, a, a national assembly. A Nigerian senator was weeping, recounting the atrocities that have been committed all over Nigeria. There is no square mile of, this, of the nation that is, 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 uh, is spared right now. I, I don't know how we are getting on. I don't know how we have managed to keep going on. But I hope that government and, and the decision makers to see that they have a role to play. Because as Congressman Wu says a said a moment ago, where we are, where we are, it's it's, it's a skyfall problem, by which I mean, it's going to be everybody's problem. It's not going to be a Nigerian problem when it starts. It's going to be a West African problem. It's going to be an African problem. It's going to be a European problem, and it's going to be beyond that. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, next question yeah. to you. Next question uh, to uh, you. Others, others. Next okay. question to Congressman Smith. Uh, Congressman Smith, in addition to the humanitarian issue, what is the security implications of Nigeria, especially as it comes to global terrorism? Uh, thank you. First of all, I think everybody on this Zoom need to recognize that Congressman Frank Wolf, Chairman Wolf, uh, wrote the law, the International Religious Freedom Act, which created countries of particular concern, the office, the ambassador at large, and USERF, which is the independent commission uh, that provides incredible insights as to what is happening. And as you pointed out, they just came out with their report. Uh, and it is an indictment of what is happening in Nigeria today uh, with the Islamic um, 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 uh, state in, in West Africa, the Boko Haram, the Fulani, uh, all of whom and others who are not only killing, maiming, kidnapping, and beheading. There was a, a Christian from Cannes, and I know the, that organization very well. I've met with them many times in um, uh, Nigeria. They took one of their leaders and beheaded him because he would not renounce his faith. It reminds me, you know, getting to a moment ago when uh, uh, the doc made a, a very important point about how did we get here? Uh, 10 years ago, I began holding hearings and I've hold, held 10 hearings on uh, religious persecution and human rights in, in Nigeria uh, over these years. Most recently was just uh, in December. 
uh, as co-chair of the Lantos Commission. And, uh, and the Assistant Secretary, Johnny Carson, Frank, actually said, this is Assistant Secretary for African Affairs under the Obama administration, uh, that Boko Haram was just trying to embarrass good luck Jonathan by blowing up bridges, by, by doing the mayhem that they were doing, rather than to recognize the radical Islamic um, uh, beliefs that they hold, uh, that they believe they can kill and they're doing it uh, in the name of God. They do it against Muslims, as we all know. Pious Muslims have been, I remember going to Jos uh, and met, meeting with Archbishop Kegama, visiting churches, all of which have been firebombed. Uh, then I met with the Islamic leadership in Jos and they had nothing but respect for the Christians and vice versa. And they said, they're targeting us too. Uh, these radicals are targeting us and killing us and forcing some to become radical against their will. So, you know, there's even one of the men I met in an IDP camp, uh, Habila Adamu, I was so impressed with his story. I brought him to the United States. He gave testimony and he said, Boko Haram broke into my home, dragged me out, put an AK-47 to my head and said, you convert or we blow your brains out. Well, he said, I'm ready to meet my God. They pulled the trigger, disfigured his face very significantly, uh, but he survived. And when he came and testified, he said, you've got to realize uh, this is not about economics. Uh, this is all about radical jihadist uh, beliefs. Uh, so the impact, not just for Nigeria, which is the most populous state or country in, uh, it's often been said as goes Nigeria, so goes the rest of Africa. Um, you know, this, this gives aid and comfort to the other jihadists uh, throughout Africa. And of course they're expanding. And the Fulani cut not just in, in Nigeria, but they're found in many other places. And this foolishness of suggesting that this is a fight between herdsmen and farmers. Uh, no, this is a fight of radical jihadism. And finally, just let me say, Bahari has not performed well. Finally, uh, Nigeria was designated a CPC country, again, pursuant to your historic law, as you know, uh, Chairman Wolf. And um, I'm not sure the Secretary of State brought that up in his call. There was nothing in, in the readout of that call with Bahari. Uh, so I'm very concerned that they will not look to renew it. And I think they need to be looking to use the sanctions embedded in your law, Frank, uh, a dozen and a half very important sanctions uh, to hold individuals to account. Uh, because if we just turn the page and say it's getting better and put a false facade on it, uh, shame on us when so many people are being killed and maimed. So it, can, it could unsettle, as uh, was indicated, you know, the, the fragility of that country. Uh, which is very real, um, and, and they could further plunder into a door four. Uh, it was one of the commissioners, um, uh, uh, Gary Bauer, said more Christians have been killed in the last year in Nigeria than all of the Middle East. I mean, this is, this is one of the worst catastrophic. And what is Bahari doing? He has filled his ranks of leadership, military and police with Fulani. You know, in the past, uh, on Good Luck Jonathan, uh, he had a mix of Christians and Muslims. Uh, and, and it was, you know, and I visited several times. Um, at least they were trying, uh, but they had that, that, that coalition uh, that was together of both faiths. Uh, not, that's not the case under Bahari. So the concern is, and, and there was just another article that came out of persecution.org, um, and they pointed out another uh, killing of Christians uh, by the Fulani. And they had three days advance notice that this was probably going to happen. Nothing was done by the police. And that has been the problem. Lack of response by police uh, to something that is known in advance, as well as something that has actually happened. It's been, it's been neglect on the part of Bahari, and he needs to be held to account for that as well. So we've got much to do. Uh, I'm planning, Frank, and of introducing a bill called the Nigeria Religious uh, Freedom Act uh, when we return. Some of the recommendations made by the USERF will be embedded in that bill. Uh, I did the same thing years ago with Ethiopia, and we did get movement. It passed the House, never passed the Senate, like so many, and Tom and I know that, with all of the joint work we've done on, on China. So many things never get through the Senate. Uh, but we need to put a marker down that's very clear. And again, one of it will be to ensure that entities of concern, Boko Haram and the Islamic State for, 
for uh, uh, Western um, uh, uh, Africa, that they be so redesignated, and above all that, that Nigeria stay as a CPC country and real action items follow that. You know, the enforcement of it, the, the sanctions were waived when Secretary Pompeo did it. Um, they went from watch list a year ago to this year doing the, um, um, the actual CPC designation. So President Bahari has had enough uh, alert and warning that we're not kidding. Stop allowing this, this torture, killing, maiming, raping, uh, and abduction, weddings. Can you imagine uh, uh, Fulani um, uh, radical jihadists going to a wedding, killing people at the wedding? And in one case, they abducted the bride and groom. Uh, that sounds like the kind of thing Saddam Hussein's sons used to do uh, at weddings. Uh, it's, it's, it's perverted, it's gross, and is a serious violation of human rights. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Congressman Smith. Uh, Congressman Swazi. Uh, the Catholic bishops and Protestant bishops and the pastors in uh, the country, particularly the Catholic bishops, the, the, the Catholic bishop of, of Kaduna who's spoken out, they, they're crying out for help. They don't feel that the church in the West or any of the Western governments have been very supportive of them. Why do you think that the church in the West has not spoken out and, and what do you think they can do? And the other question is that they've asked why doesn't the Western media cover us? You remember, uh, God bless her, Christiane Amanpour, whenever there was a crisis somewhere, she would go there. And now it seems that no one goes there. But do you have any thoughts or comments to the Catholic bishops who ask why has the church in the West and the governments not come to their aid? Well, thanks so much, uh, Frank, for inviting me to be here today. And uh, I want to make it clear from the beginning that I'm not an expert the way Chris Smith and you are, Frank, or the way you are, Dr. Uh, Akiebi. Thank you so much for being here today, O'Shea. Uh, I'm very interested in the issue of religious freedom, as you know, uh, serving as the former co-chair of the National Prayer Breakfast, where we discussed the issue of religious freedom throughout the world. And I think that the reason that uh, this issue has not broken through is because the media is very different today than it was 10 or 20 years ago even. And there are so many issues out there uh, to gather attention uh, that it's hard to break through to get people to pay attention to these issues. I think everybody's heard of Boko Haram. They don't realize, however, that it's a relatively small group of people in such a large country. Uh, I don't think that people are educated on the issues of Nigeria. And uh, I think that, uh, similar to what the doctor was saying, is that we can't wait until this erupts into a full-blown genocide uh, before people start paying attention the way that they need to pay attention. And unfortunately for the people that are listening here today and the people interested in Nigeria, we just have a lot of work to do. We have to educate people about what's going on. Chris and I can tell you about the experience we've had with the Uyghurs uh, in, in Western China. Very few people were aware of the Uyghurs three years ago. Uh, even now, I'm sure many people on this call are not aware of the Uyghurs, but we've been working on it and getting more and more attention over a period of years by uh, passing legislation, by holding hearings, by trying to bring people together. And that's what you've done here, Frank, is you've brought people together to try and educate people about this awful, awful activity that's going on uh, in the most populous state in the continent of Africa. Uh, you know, the United States of America uh, took this very important role uh, at the end of December of 2020 as the uh, previous administration was leaving to declare this formally as a country of particular concern. That's a very positive development. However, the funding that was available from the United States, the foreign aid to Nigeria was sent nonetheless uh, for infrastructure. And we have to really work hard here in the United States and elsewhere to designate some of these funds to be used to actually expose what is happening. It, we can't rely upon uh, self-interested parties coming from the country itself that we don't know what their agenda is. We need to have a, a full-blown exposition of what's actually transpiring on the ground in Nigeria and expose that to the public. And I think that the bishops that you re reference, uh, Frank, 
uh, the church not bringing enough attention to this are in the same similar situation. They just simply are not well enough acquainted with what's going on in Nigeria. And it's up to us to do a lot more work to educate people. I looked at some of the questions in the chat room or some of the, 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 the questions and answers. The people who are on this call, the people on this panel are very engaged and very interested. And there've been stories written, as you mentioned, in the New York Times and in some other prominent papers. But as far as the people go, as far as the masses go, they have no idea where Nigeria is, how many people live in Nigeria, and the awful atrocities that are taking place there. And we simply need to continue to raise our voices to educate people as to what is transpiring here with Boko Haram, with the ISIS affiliated agencies, with the role of the government in not stamping this out in Nigeria, uh, and try to bring more people to our cause. Now, that's not the answer people wanna hear. We just simply have a lot of work to do. The doctor said, uh, I hope it's not too late. Well, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, it's never too late to do the right thing. So we simply have to educate people about what's going on and what we, what, what, with so many people on this call, I'm sure, are so frustrated because it's so apparent to them. They've been engaged in this for so many years, and they're so frustrated with the sense of helplessness as all this awful violence and abuse is taking place. Uh, we simply have more work to do. And I am joining you here today uh, at Frank's request because I'm going to join you in this fight to try and educate uh, the U.S. population, our government leaders, and others about the atrocities that are taking place and take action to hold those that are uh, committing these atrocities accountable and to put systems and procedures in place that will try and make a change for the people of Nigeria. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, following up on that, uh, this question would go both to Congressman Smith and also you. It is always helpful for members of Congress to visit a crisis area to see in person what's happening. <laughs> There's nothing like being on the ground to talk with the people, hear their stories. Do you think there should be a bipartisan delegation of both Republicans and Democrats, maybe House and Senate, to, to go to Ni Nigeria, not just to Abuja or Lagos, but to go up to Jos and go through some of the areas and then come back and report to Congress and report to the administration of the findings? Congressman Smith? Uh, I would say absolutely yes. I think there, be, there should be more than one. Uh, you know, one of the things that you find when you're on the ground, and I remember meeting with the families of the Chibok schoolgirls who had been abducted, uh, you not only learn what happened uh, and what was is, you know, their fears and their agony, but you come back so motivated to do even more. Uh, you meet with all parties, as you do. You and I have done that many times, Frank, uh, all over the world. And, and it does leave, lead to legislation. It leads to policy, to admonishing the administration, either congratulating them on good work they're doing or to hold them to account. I'll give you one example. And you know, my good friend Tom Swazi just mentioned, you know, we need to get a better handle on what's actually happening. Uh, Bob Destro, who was our Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, uh, he had recommended, he had a program called the Conflict Stabilization Operations that would would really try to find out where all of this is happening, uh, to do an analysis that would be second to none, uh, to say, who's doing it? When are they doing it? What has been the response? For example, when the Fulani go in and they destroy another church and blow up another church, um, what was the response of the, of the police? We don't have, other than anecdotally, that information in a way that could be very actionable. And uh, so I'm hoping, because that has been seemingly taken off the table by the new administration, that we could get them to take that up again. We want to know what is happening. Knowledge is power. As you and I know, having met with Sharansky so many times, uh, Frank, having gone to Perm Camp 35 in the Ural Mountains, um, a thousand miles outside of Moscow back in the 1980s, you know, if you don't have the information, if you don't chronicle the human rights abuse and the, and the violence and the atrocities, good luck trying to stop it. It also will lead, as we talked Tom mentioned, and you, uh, about the, the lack of media attention uh, when you chronicle what's happening. You know, Darfur took a long time to get on the map. And even there, there were people who were looking askance uh, to that 
those crimes against humanity. So in that, that genocide. So, um, you know, the conflict stabilization operations, we need to get that back on track and trips uh, to, like you said, and I went, when I went to Jos and I met with the family members grieving their loved ones who have been firebombed and met with people who were without limbs, uh, it motivated me to triple the work that I would work. So members, both sides of the aisle, we need to do it in a bipartisan way. Uh, Congressman Schwazi? Of, of absolutely, we need to uh, have such a trip. Uh, I know there's been other trips in the past, but do we need to have a broader bipartisan uh, attempt to address this. I think that Karen Bass uh, from Foreign Affairs and even Greg Meeks from Foreign Affairs, the new chairman of Foreign Affairs, would be very interested in helping to, to make that happen. And I'll make a personal request to them to ask for their assistance. Of course, there's restrictions related to the pandemic still, and that won't be lifting in, uh, for a few months, but uh, we hope, I should say. Uh, but I think that, you know, we, we really need to do exactly what Chris is saying. It, it, it's not good enough. Uh, you know, I, 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 you can imagine I did a lot of reading to prepare for this call today. And, you know, it's not enough uh, to understand the issues of poverty, to understand the issues of climate change, to understand the uh, conflicts between the, the herders and the farmers and to understand the pockets of who lives in what part of the country. We need systemic analysis to back up uh, what is actually happening uh, with concrete data as to where the violence is taking place to actually list uh, uh, cumulative numbers and locations and the government response. And you will see based upon having more than just anecdotes. I mean, anecdotes are very important, obviously, to inform things, but then you need concrete data to look at the systemic issues that the country is facing uh, because of uh, uh, the religious uh, strife that's taking place and uh, the attacks that are taking place. Uh, I'll ask this next question to all, all three, and I'm gonna combine two, because in about five minutes, we're gonna go out to the, uh, the people that are calling in. But Boko Haram, since it was said, has killed more people in Nigeria than ISIS. Uh, Congressman Smith <laughs> killed in Iraq and Syria combined. And there are reports that ISIS is now operating in the Lake Chad region. Should there be sort of a planned Nigeria, Lake Chad region to bring together the agencies of the US government and also the World Food Program and all the different groups so that there's a comprehensive program to deal with all the issues and to work with also the other Western governments like England and France. And to combine that question for all, all three, in 2001, President George W. Bush appointed a special envoy for Sudan, former Senator John Danforth, who effectively coordinated the U.S. response to the crisis there among the various government agencies that worked with their allies. Do you think we, we need a plan Nigeria slash Lake Chad region and also a consideration for a special envoy like a John Danforth? Maybe go to you first, Congressman Smith, then Congressman Schwazi, then, then Dr. Ikebe. Well, Frank, thank you. Uh, and you've been advocating for that. Our uh, Nigeria Religious Freedom Act will have a provision in it uh, that calls for a special envoy. You led the effort for the special envoy for Darfur, uh, for Sudan. And what a difference that made uh, through different administrations. So I, you know, it, 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 as you said, there would have not have been a peace agreement uh, without Senator Danforth and the way he cobbled, uh, got disparate factions together. Um, and, you know, ambassadors are great, but having somebody that has the ear of the president um, um, and really can act in a very, very decisive manner uh, and bringing all parties to the table can make a huge difference. Uh, we also need to include, obviously, the international community, the UK, particularly the House of Commons, David Alton and other uh, members of the Lord House of Lords and Commons have been very active. Last year, they did a, a, a breakthrough study on uh, the Fulani and, uh, and about you know, this, this radical jihadist. Uh, it, it was a report that is a must read for anyone concerned about this. Uh, so they'll, I know, will join us in, uh, in, in those efforts. Uh, but the status quo is just totally unacceptable. Uh, there is, you know, we know the, the neighboring countries are all uh, deeply concerned um, because obviously the, the hate uh, spewed out by radical jihadism uh, affects their populations as well. 
Uh, and of course, there's always not just deaths and rapes. There's also huge numbers of refugees who do flee. Uh, and that creates more instability and more agony for people uh, on the ground. So there needs to be an, an, or, you know, there needs to be an all out effort. Um, you know, I, I saw that, that uh, Bahari uh, recommended that somehow, um, or not somehow, that AFRICOM relocate to the subcontinent, which I've been advocating for years. They're now in Germany. Uh, but, you know, the U.S. ought to train, and there was an attempt to do more training. And, of course, we got to make sure that the Leahy principles are adhered to, the Leahy law, uh, so that we don't train human rights abusers. Uh, but there needs to be training of police and of military. We know that we're, we've sold them a number of aircraft. They got one so far. Uh, we got to make sure they're not used uh, against Christians. Uh, you know, it's an open question. Will that air, one aircraft, it's one of 12 uh, by 2024. Uh, and now it's, it's great to have that kind of capability, but let's make sure that they're being used uh, for only good purposes. And I got it again, Frank, conflict stabilization operations. We need to get that. It, 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 there was an actual proposal uh, that was made by Bob Destro. It's been taken off the table. And I know Tom, you know, absolutely agrees. Uh, we need to quantify, qualify, make it all very clear uh, what is happening because knowledge is power. And we're able to do more when we have the best possible, reliable and accurate information. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Quasi. You know, and I'm initially very attracted to the idea of moving AFRICOM from Germany uh, to the continent itself. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's seemingly unrelated, but really is very related, is the recent decision by the administration to leave Afghanistan. Uh, you know, I've been defending keeping troops in Afghanistan for many, many years, but I was very persuaded recently uh, by the fact that the reason we've spent as much time in, in Afghanistan is to stop new terror cells from growing there. And we had to be present to stop them from growing. But as we know, there are terror cells growing uh, throughout Africa right now. Uh, and we have to figure out how to prevent uh, ISIS from getting stronger uh, throughout the world, but certainly in Africa as well. And uh, Nigeria is, is a, a hotbed. Of, of where we need to uh, have a presence to make sure that we are identifying what's going on. Again, I've seen so many decisions made in the heat of the moment after the fact with, that are not informed. We have to have a lot more data as to what's going on in Nigeria on a regular basis. And I know that a lot of people on this call, I'm sure have that data. It's a matter of gathering it in a credible way that could be relied upon uh, by different decision makers here within the United States of America. When we're sending $300 billion, $300 billion in aid to the Nigerian government, there's no reason that we shouldn't be uh, mandating that a portion of that money is used for the information gathering that we're talking about so we can actually find out exactly what's happening. Not necessarily giving the money directly to the government either, but also to, uh, to outside agencies that can use those funds to document as clearly as possible what's going on. Thank you, Congress. We're, we're almost at the time for the panel. I just, I know Dr. Ikebeke is a little bit of a communication problem if he's still on. Uh, doctor, are you still on? You're on mute, Doctor. You're on mute. Yes, I am. I am. I have muted myself. Okay. Well, in, in wrapping up, because this will be the last before they go to the general panel. Uh, you're, you're on the ground there and you, you know these issues. What do you think will happen in Nigeria if nothing is done? And could the country actually implode? Yes, yes, it can and will. I'm sorry to say that. I am not alarmist. Nigeria can implode, it will implode. What has gotten us to this position is the denial on, on, on the leadership, is the denial on the elite that too big to fail. Nigeria is not too big to fail. Um, when you have governors crying, uh, making open statements, pointing accusing fingers at the president that the security situation is bad, now they are roping people in traffic. Yes, Nigeria can, 
and it will. Unfortunately, uh, time in the in the years that have been involved in this, Congressman, you know that we have pushed. I have joined you to many meetings to push for uh, an envoy, an envoy for Nigeria. We produce this book. This is a 310-page book on the on the silent killings in Nigeria. It is real. It is. It's real. There is an urgency for the United States, the British government, the French government, the German government to do something quickly as possible. And I think the best way, uh, including doing the, the visit by Congress people, is for the President of the United States to appoint an envoy as a matter of urgency. What Nigeria is faced with now is existential. It is existential. And if Nigeria implodes, right now, Chad just lost their president. Niger just suffered a coup. Bene is unstable. Cote d'Ivoire is unstable. Mali is unstable. Cameroon, the man there is weak. ISIS and ISWAP, they have access to the whole of West and Central Africa. If it happens the way they have planned it, there will be no time for discussion. Please, please, I beg of you, those of you who are in Congress and in a position to take decisions. It is urgent. It is not something that can be done next I thank you, Doctor. I, I want to turn there's a communication problem, but I think we heard most. I want to turn this back to the FMC that has taken questions from various people. And let me suggest, Doctor, that uh, if you come back on, that you should turn off your video and just use the audio. Thank you, Congressman Wolf. Our first question is from Bucci Okeke, who's in our audience today. Uh, Bucci, if you can go ahead and unmute your microphone, you can ask your question of our panel. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Well, thank you. So uh, thank you so very much, uh, Congressman and uh, people in the panel for having this uh, session. Uh, I'm a very concerned um, citizen. I migrated to the United States uh, in 2015. Uh, because of the insecurity going on in modern day in Nigeria right now. And I'm from the Igbo speaking part of Nigeria. And um, I believe, Mr. Chris, uh, you've been to Nigeria yourself, so you know the whole, the factions and all of that. Um, and I want to just say this uh, categorically because I am very, uh, I'm very in tune with what's happening. And I want to give you guys a, a light on, you know, how to help make things faster for, for everyone on this panel, especially if we want to see a lasting change in Nigeria before, uh, before we all leave this earth. The truth of the matter is the way it is currently, Nigeria is fighting both a religious war and uh, a tribal war. And the religious war is from the people who want to implode and put in the jihadi um, you know, faction and way of life, as well as a tribal war where we are seeing the Igbos and the Yorubas and Aosas all saying that they want to separate from Nigeria. I feel like the first things that the first things should be on the agenda should be how do we disintegrate Nigeria? How do we make Nigeria go back to everyone goes back to their own particular space? Looking at the history of Nigeria, you would see that the founding fathers of modern day Nigeria never wanted Nigeria to work. And that was why they put Nigeria the way it is. And we have, um, you, you, we, have, we have spoken about how much uh, people migrate to, um, to other parts of the world and develop other parts of the world. Most of the people who do this are the Igbos, the Igbo speaking tribe of Nigeria. They're the ones who are most concerned about development and progression. But there are some sects of people in Nigeria that are seeking to hold Nigeria down. And you've mentioned them. We all know them and they're the, they the fullness. They are the ones who are hell bent on making sure that Nigeria becomes South Sudan or becomes Syria or, and just ensure that the caliphate of militants, there will be a hybrid of militants that will be sent all the way from Nigeria to other parts of West Africa to cause even more havoc for Africans. 
So I would say this, and I'm, this is just my suggestion, it doesn't have to be followed, but I would say that right now, all hands should be on deck to see how we can disintegrate Nigeria. How can we ensure that people who are shouting or clamoring for Biafra, people who are clamoring for Odudua, people who are clamoring for whatever they are clamoring for, how can we ensure that they can go back and you know, um, create their own nations in Nigeria and see how those people can develop uh, you know, collectively as a group or as a tribe. Because if not, if we continue to say that we want to go in and create a system whereby we help uh, people in power, the, they've already infiltrated. We will only be, we, you, the Americans will only be giving the secrets to the enemies. And that's the fact. We would only be telling, empowering the enemy for what they already have planned for the future. They already know what they want and they would go out there and even create more havoc. So this is my suggestion. And I want to see what you guys think about it. Thank you very much. Moderator. Oh, um, I, I believe he, um, he wanted okay, why, to- Why don't you ask him another question? And I think you know, he had a big, he makes a good point, but why don't you ask another question? Uh, our next question is from uh, from Ray Iminu, who's in our, our audience and has a question. Ray, if you can uh, go ahead and unmute your microphone, you can ask our panel your question. And when folks do have questions, if you can get to them quickly, that way we can make sure that everybody has a chance to, to get to theirs. Mr. Iminu, if you'd like to unmute your microphone. You're on mute, Mr. Okay. Amino. I think we're having some problems with Mr. Amino's um, microphone. So we'll go on to, uh, to our next question. And that comes from Kenneth Okobene. Kenneth Okobene uh, has a couple questions. Kenneth, if you'd like to, uh, to pick one of them and go ahead and unmute your microphone, you can ask our panel your question. Um, sure, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I'm Ken Cullen from um, Philadelphia. I've uh, been in the U.S. Um, since uh, about what, 19 years now. I uh, came here as a student. I'm originally from JAS, which, as we all know, is the hotbed for um, extremism. I have a two-part um, question. Um, the first question, basically, uh, what ways can Congress engage more with uh, Nigerian um, civil society organizations? Uh, because from experience, you know, once you um, you dialogue with the government, they usually cover a lot of um, human rights. So what um, steps are you guys taking um, to seek um, data information directly from um, the CSOs, um, I think I directly. I, I have changed my internet source. Can I go ahead? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So basically, in summary, um, how can the Congress engage more with um CSO rather than um, engaging the government directly? Because we've seen on um, the last six years, um, it's yeah. been a very um, um the political government in there. So there've been you know um shielding or been covering up a lot of human rights abuses. And secondly, um, ju the judiciary is very important. Um, I need some um, How can the um, Congress encourage a more independent and responsive um, judiciary within the ambits of Nigerian laws? Thank you. It's a politicization of all the institutions. Walter O'Negan was the name of the Chief yeah. Okay, and, and if our panel would like to uh, to go ahead and ask, answer the questions as far as what Congress can do and also how to uh, improve the judiciary in, in Nigeria. Well, just very briefly, you know, Buhari changed the, or replaced the Chief Justice with a Fulani, uh, which was, which is what he's been done, been doing with everything, especially in the police and military side. Uh, there's, you know, in terms of Context, you know, and I know Tom feels the same way, and Frank Wolf and I uh, always did this. You meet with everyone, and the context has to be with civil society, the churches, the synagogues, and, and not in this case synagogues, but certainly in other countries, but <clears throat> but with the Muslims, with the imams, because there are many imams who are <clears throat> absolutely appalled by what Boko Haram and the other radical Islamists are, are doing uh, to them and to their their uh, co-religionists. So th 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 you know, that sends a message as well. Me with individual lawmakers, I mean, I've been to Abuja uh, and met with the, the speaker and, and, and foreign affairs people uh, in both houses. <clears throat> then they realize and get to see that, you know, where the Congress is coming from and our empathy. 
And I'll give an example, again, where I learned something. For three years, I tried to get Boko Haram designated as a FTO, foreign terrorist organization. The Obama administration would not do it. So I held hearings. On the day I was going to mark up my bill to so designate it, they changed their policy and they said, we're designating them as an FTO. But what preceded all of that was meeting with members of the parliament, or the, of the Congress, both sides, and they had a mistaken view as to what FTO actually meant. Somehow it was just branding uh, Nigeria as a terrorist state rather than branding the individual group. I was kind of taken back by that false impression. And when they realized that we're looking to help them uh, because we want to track the flow of arms and money and everything else uh, to these organizations with an FTO designation, um, they thought it was a good idea. But again, it was that contact with individual lawmakers and governors. You know, we, we, we miss a great opportunity to know what's really going on when we just talk to the central government uh, in Abuja and don't talk to uh, the individual governors. And I've met with many individual governors over, over the years, including right here in this office, uh, and you do get great insights uh, as to what's going on that then are actionable. And to that original question about the dissolution, um, all of us are concerned that, that one, there will be more death and destruction and perhaps even a genocide. Uh, the crimes against humanity are already taking place uh, in Nigeria. But, you know, look at what happened in Yugoslavia. Um, you know, when, when, when it just all came apart and the great loss of life that occurred uh, there, uh, which got even, so it could get much worse. That's why the special envoy and the coordination with other countries as well, there needs to be more of a UN effort. Frankly, it's been, you know, the, the ICC, International Criminal Court, uh, has taken forever uh, to bring indictments against individuals who have committed horrific crimes. Um, we, sh we should even be thinking about a hybrid court uh, like what um, Dr. White and um, did and um, and um, um, and others in Sierra Leone or in Rwanda or in the former Yugoslavia itself. Uh, I mean, th these crimes, if they go unattended to, uh, it breeds more impunity and more people die. But again, right now, law enforcement is not reacting. So we've got to get Bahari uh, to change the policy of neglect when somebody says, we have actionable information that this church might be attacked or as it's even happening uh, so that uh, people are protected by a rapid deployment of a, of a police force, a federal force as it is. So <clears throat> there are two questions. One is what can you, what can Congress do? Well, we have, or the United States can do generally. You have either carrots or you have sticks. We can either provide money or we can provide sanctions. We can provide assistance for infrastructure, which is something we're doing right now, or, or we could use some of that money and designate it for particular purposes, or we can sanction individuals that try and affect their business in, uh, interest. We could look at uh, the trading relationships that they have with the United States of America. We could try and put s sanctions in place to hold people accountable. We could try and bring the world community along with us, certainly the West or through the United Nations, again, with either carrots or with sticks. So, and the, a gentleman suggested, why don't we dissolve the country? Uh, you know, I, I have to be very candid with you. I don't have any clue whatsoever as to what the answer is. I'm the least educated person on this entire call as to what the right answer is for Nigeria. What needs to be done is there needs to be a consensus built by the, the people on this call with groups interested in this people involved with the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, with our diplomats, the State Department, and with our military, quite frankly, to develop a consensus as to what the game plan is from Nigeria. Right now, there are so many competing concerns for the US's attention that Nigeria, while it is an issue of concern, it's a country of particular concern because of the awful atrocities that are taking place, there is not that much energy focused on it as it is, for example, let's say China, which is the, the new issue that has become such a tremendous focus in the country. So the good news is, is that Frank Wolf, Wolf is, is, is passionately involved in this. Chris Smith is passionately involved in this. Many others are passionately involved in this. 
What I can do to be helpful is to try and get others interested in this, especially those people on the committees of jurisdictions. Mainly, I'd be most concerned about foreign affairs. Greg Smith is the chair, uh, Greg Meeks is the chairman of foreign affairs. He's my neighbor in Congress as far as his district is right next to mine. I have a very good personal relationship with him. Uh, he's always been interested in the, in the continent of Africa. So I will bring this to his attention personally and ask him what his plans are, which I'm not sure he knows much more about this than I do. I will also bring it to the attention of the subcommittee chairwoman, uh, Karen Bass, who's very interested in this area as well. And I'm sure they know much more as well. So the key is to get more and more people interested in this. And then there are some friends that we can talk to on the Armed Services Committee as well to see what kind of uh, interest there is in, in paying attention to the, the terrorism activity that's going on in the area, which there is plenty of attention now, but what can be done to be incre increase that? Is there one last question, Paul? Yes, sir, Congressman. Uh, Margarita Starkovicute, a former member of the European Parliament, has actually joined us. And uh, Margarita, if you can go ahead and unmute your microphone, you can ask our panel your question. Go ahead, Margarita. Can't hear you, Margarita. Still can't hear you. Okay, I think I think she's having uh, some problems with her microphone. So we can uh, we can go ahead and wrap up if you'd like, Congressman Wolf, and um, get some last statements from our panel. Okay, I'll do. I will. Uh, I'll turn it over to both Mr. Smith first, then uh, Mr. Swazi, and then uh, Dr. Becky to make some closing remarks. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, thank you, Frank, and thank you all of you. Good to see my good friend Tom Swazi, Doctor Becky. Thank you for your uh, tremendous insights and work. Um, when we return, I will be introducing the Nigeria Religious Freedom Act. Uh, it is still a work in progress, but we've got a, a lot of the provisions uh, worked out. So I invite any thoughts anyone might have on that. Um, we really need, you know, when when the Secretary of State had this conversation. And with the top commander for AFRICOM uh, visited uh, Nigeria, I saw no mention whatsoever of religious persecution, Fulani, or any other issues. Now, maybe it all happened behind closed doors, which is very possible. Uh, but we have to really be very clear and unambiguous about uh, our knowledge of what's going on. And again, we need to expand it. I think the conflict uh, uh, stability operations uh, initiative, which was pulled back on, needs to be re-engaged. Um, you know, De Deloitte was one of the ones that would have been a part of that, at least that's my understanding. So we bring in people who could really chronicle these human rights abuses quickly and accurately. Uh, but it, there needs to be an all-out effort. A special envoy is absolutely necessary. And, and as Frank pointed out so well, Chairman Wolf, uh, you know, it made all the difference in the world in the peace deal. Uh, it also made a huge difference, all the difference in the world, I would suggest, uh, in, in with the Northern Ireland situation, uh, when we had a, uh, a special envoy uh, who helped broker, get people uh, to, to, to find a peaceful solution. Uh, you know, dissolution of a country is, is um, a huge, potentially catastrophic step. Um, you know, we're hoping that we can get this terrible bloodletting and this radicalization because what's happening as we talk is that more young people are getting radicalized every day. Uh, and then they join the ranks of those who kill, maim, rape, and, and abduct. So uh, we're in a race for time. Nigeria is, you know, the people, it's a, it's a country of faith. Um, you know, every trip I've made there, my first trip was, uh, one of the first trips was on behalf of human trafficking. Um, and, and so many young women and girls, uh, I spoke to a group in, in Lagos, uh, about trafficking there. And, and when I went and visited with the women in the shelters uh, and those who were taking care of them was just in awe of the love and the compassion and the faith-based view that they had uh, towards their neighbor. Uh, so they are wonderful people uh, and they don't, they don't deserve this. Nobody does. They don't deserve this, this uh, radicalization uh, and this bloodletting. So we need to triple our efforts uh, and again, status quo, I am concerned, and I say this, and Tom, you could help out on this as well, uh, that, that the designation of CPC 
does not get downgraded, that it may be put on a watch list again. Uh, and we need to be looking at the sanctions. We've got Magnitsky sanctions that we can level against individuals. And Frank, in his everlasting wisdom, put sanctions into his bill uh, that were waived the first go around by Pompeo. You know, a good faith effort here. You're on the list. Now make reforms. Uh, but those sanctions need to be looked at uh, to impose on individuals and on the government itself. Thank you so very much. I want to thank you, Frank and Chris and Dr. Akiebi. Thank you so much for the good work that you're doing. I just want to pledge my commitment to work with all of you to try and bring this to more people's attention uh, and to bring the resources that are necessary to try and address these awful situations that are taking place every day uh, to such a wonderful people of the people of Nigeria. Thank you. Dr. Becky? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Wolf. I, I want to end by saying that the problem we have is structural. The problem we have is existential. It's, it threatens the existence of the country if nothing is done. But I don't support the breakup of Nigeria. As an individual, my organization as well does not support the breakup of Nigeria. The problem of Nigeria can be solved if we bring everybody back on the table to talk together, if we respect religious freedom, if, we, if the government does what it ought to do, if we operate a federal system. The, the Nigerian government structurally is a federal government, but right now it is not operating as one. It should be forced to go back and operate not as a unitary government, but as a federal system where the states can take decisions on security issues that affect them. I am not for the breakup of Nigeria. My organization is not for the breakup of Nigeria. I think what we should do is to look for positive ways in which Nigerian problems can be solved. Time is not on our side. Time is not on the side of the international group of countries that are interested in what's going on in Africa. Now is the time to act. I plead with you, I thank you for this, and I'm grateful for the, the promises that the congressmen have made. I think we should move fast to make them, uh, to, to realize them. Uh, this is why, this is how I would like to close. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Well, I, I wanna close by thanking uh, Congressman Smith and Congressman Schwazi. I mean, they got a big heart and frankly, uh, they're two of the very best that you could have. So their activity may end up saving thousands and thousands of lives. I am grateful, and I know the people of Nigeria are. Secondly, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ebeki, too, for taking this time and for all, all of your work, Dr. I am very, very grateful. And I lastly want to thank FMC. It was very good for them to hold this panel. And I'm grateful for them and I'm grateful for all the people that have, that have watched. May good things and God bless this effort to help the people of Nigeria. They're good people and they need our help. Thank you all for